Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to give people a few minutes to finish logging on. Um, I'll say this again uh, just before we have the pre presenters uh, speak, but we will be recording this webinar. So if you know someone who wanted to be on but wasn't able to make it, or if you'd like to reference any of the material, uh, it will be available on the SSTI website. We have a lot of slides with a lot of information, and we wanted to get that information up onto the website so you could um, look back on it if you need to. Uh, we'll also be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but if you think of something during the presentation, you can submit a question at any point by typing it into the chat box. Uh, you, if you don't see the chat box on your screen, you can look in the upper right-hand corner and there should be a little orange tab that will allow the chat box to come out and you'll be able to type the questions in. And again, we'll be taking that at the end. Um, so I am very pleased to have um, several presenters with us today. And I'm actually going to step aside and let Eric Sundquist, who is our managing director here at SSTI, do the presentation of uh, tell talk a little bit about the project and also introduce our speakers from Virginia. And uh, again, we'll be recording this and we'll take questions at the end. You can type a question in at any point by typing it into the chat box and then we'll take those at the end. So Eric, I'm gonna go ahead and let you introduce our speakers and introduce SSTI for anybody who may not be familiar with it. Thanks, Robbie. Um, and again, welcome everybody. I'm really pleased to be able to kick off this webinar. It's one that we've wanted to do for a while. Uh, really exciting. I'll tell you why in a second if you're not already plugged into that. But um, SSTI, for those who don't know, is a network of um, DOT executives with a small staff here at the University of Wisconsin. Um, we, we bring our executives together on various topics and meetings. We do technical assistance. We've been involved in the periphery on, on smart scale in um, Virginia, but uh, and are getting more involved. Um, and then we do things like this webinar, publications, and so forth. So check us out on the web, ssti.us. Be happy if, uh, if you happen to be from a DOT that isn't yet involved with us to fill you in, or if you are just a transportation pro professional who would like to work with us in some way, we'd be glad to hear from you. So with that, um, the, the, we all know how hard it is to make change in, in policy. It's just really tough. I mean, you, the, the barriers to change are so many. Staff is stressed just doing things that are, you know, happening on time and sometimes they have to do day to day. Um, you have, if you need to go to the legislature, you have all kinds of people who have strong opinions and partisan differences and not enough expertise often in particular issues. We have media that often aren't very helpful. They've been decimated and have less expertise than ever in terms of technical questions. Uh, you have various interest groups that have an interest in keeping things the same way and on and on and on. But So that's why I'm so excited about this effort in Virginia formerly called HB2, now renamed SmartScale, um, because it is um, just a total success story. It was a, an initiative that was led as an administration was just coming in to, to um, occupy the Capitol, or the governor's office. Um, it was across parties because the, it's a Democratic governor and Republican legislature. Um, it involved staff and stakeholders and all of the folks. Um, and it and it, you know, there, it's a work in progress. I think you'll hear that there are um, elements of this that are still being developed and improved as it goes forward. But it, it, it passed muster in its first year. It um, has gotten awards now with legislative groups from around the, the region. Um, and so, it, and, and it answers, addresses a real problem in 
in transportation, which is project selection. How do we select projects that actually are most efficient, um, that serve the public the best, um, and you know don't involve um, political games and everything else? So, um, so I'm just really, really excited to have been on the periphery of this and a little bit more involved in it going forward and to hear from our presenters today. Um, we have Ronique Day, who's a policy analyst in the Secretary's office, and she was um, a big part of getting the whole program do going. She did a lot of extensive research in advance of the bill being passed and then was part of the executive oversight team as it was developed and started to, um, started to go into implementation. And Chad Tucker is an assistant division administrator in VDOT's planning division and um, is responsible for conceptual planning, performance-based planning. Now, pretty much, I would guess, over the last two years, 100% of his time or close to it has been involved in development and implementation of the smart scale prioritization process. And I can tell you from being on some of those calls that he's been a very pragmatic and effective leader in getting this, getting this through. So. With that, let me step aside, and I'm not sure if Ronique or Chad is going to go first, but you guys take it away. I believe, I believe Ronique is going to go first, and uh, you now can click on the slides and change them yourself. So take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. Muted. You might have to click the left one. Unmuted. <laughs> There we go. Muted. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you again, Eric. Um, just to go over a little bit of an, an overview of what Chad and I will be touching on today, we'll talk about the foundation of House Bill 2, integration into planning and programming, grant application, screening and validation, measures and scoring, and then round one summary and lessons learned. Um, just to, to let you all know ahead of time, we're going to go through the slides a little quick just so we can make sure that there is some time for Q&A. Um, as, as Eric mentioned, we do have a number of slides here. There's a lot of information. So we're going to try to move through them quickly just so we can make sure that we try to get a number of your, your questions answered. So as mentioned, um, HB2, which we have to, I'm still learning how to change the name, um, Smart Scale was legislation that was passed by the Virginia General Assembly in 2014. And the law was really created to improve transparency and accountability for the use of our transportation dollars. Prior to HB2, many did not know how projects went through being selected all the way to the construction phase. As mentioned, the legislation passed unanimously. The measures have to be quantifiable and objective, and that is written into the code. And it is the intent for the CTB to select the highest ranking projects. However, they do maintain the ability to choose projects out of order based on needs that they are aware of. It also requires an analysis of projects' benefits relative to its cost to construct it, which is essentially a benefit-cost analysis using the factors that are specifically called out in HB2. The policy itself took about 16 months to deliver and actually implement or begin implementation. I can say that that really was lightning rod fast. It took a lot of work and a lot of collaboration to get through that period. The factors. So the candidate projects are screened to determine if they qualify to be scored. And that really has to do with our VTRANS um, statewide transportation policy planning and goals. And Chad's going to speak a little bit more about what that screening qualification looks like. But the factors, congestion mitigation, economic development, accessibility, safety, environmental quality, and land use. And, and one of the things that we found to be a challenge was, you know, if you have an engineering background and the question is what's congestion or what's economic development to you, you'd get a number of different answers. And I, I myself do not have an engineering background. I come from a business background. So just for the fact that we realize that there are some different perspectives on these, that was really a, a big challenge and, and how to get through that so that it does mean the same thing to me as it does an engineer. 
and one thing that I will say about those factors is that in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads are areas that are you know, very dense. The congestion factor does have to be ranked the highest. So next what we did was established our, our key goals for successful implementation. Obviously to um, promote performance in the selection of the projects. You know, it, it was the thought that we should not be building projects that don't actually change the way people and goods move about provide stability to our six-year improvement program and establish a project pipeline that links planning and, and programming. The board direction we were given was to make sure that this process is simple and straightforward, that it doesn't require our applicants to invest a significant amount of time and resources. So obviously our localities, our transit entities, our MPOs, they don't have the resources or the staff like we may have, nor do they have the resources to go out and, and seek consultants to help them with that. So our CTB found that that was very important. Smart scale ultimately is about investing limited tax dollars in the right projects that meet the most critical needs in Virginia. We found that projects were being constructed and you may later be on that same road and wonder why did they do this improvement? I see no change or there really wasn't any traffic here but yet this additional lane was built. So in 2013, House Bill 2313 was passed, which was expected to generate about $4 billion over six years, which was one of the most significant increases that we've seen in, in transportation revenues in almost three decades. Because of that, there was a political will that existed to take the politics out of the six-year construction program. And so what we found is that when our administrations would change over, the present administration would have other priorities that they may have campaigned for and would put projects that were already in the process to be constructed on hold to begin a project that they felt was more important. And that system itself was thought to be very uh, broken, opaque, not a good use of taxpayer dollars. Additionally, you know, there was money that may have been sprinkled around the state in our districts, in our districts which we have nine construction districts. And because it wasn't enough for them to fully construct a project, they would bank their money until they had enough to actually get one going. And we just found that, that process was, was very inefficient. Um, you know, one of the major issues that our governor experienced coming into this administration was the 460 project. And some of you may or may not know about it. However, it was a project that the Commonwealth spent approximately $300 million on without even one shovel being put in the ground. So that too was a context to help us figure out where we're going to make sure that, that, this, that this is something that doesn't happen again. So the keys to political support, um, as mentioned, the political will was there. We wanted to take that out of the process and really use quantifiable and objective data. Um, the funding that was there, the system that we had for allocating those funds was very opaque. Many didn't know, you know where the different pots of money were flowing from and where it was going to. The six-year improvement program itself, once it was released, it was a document that included all of the construction projects. It was over a thousand pages long and many did not understand what was in it or, or what it meant. Also, in Virginia, because we have very different areas, we've got very rural areas and then, and then obviously very urban areas, there is a recognition that different parts of the states have different needs. You know, in Northern Virginia, for them, congestion, relief, is a, is a major issue, whereas in other more rural parts of the state like Southwest Virginia, they would love to have congestion. So from both sides, there was the will to make sure that this is an equal playing ground, that we try to eliminate any biases and allow everyone the opportunity to participate. The concerns that we heard from some of our local officials was that, and you, I kind of laugh, but it's Nova versus Rova, and that's Northern Virginia versus the rest of Virginia because there are great needs because Northern Virginia is one of the top most congested areas in the nation. However, we do recognize that the rest of the state equally is important to keeping the Virginia economy moving. We also heard that they thought there was a scheme to send all the money to the D.C. suburbs, um, and that also there was a lot of concern at the local level of the ability to get the support for the legislature to have things move along and also recognize that locals need to be able to participate as well. 
Public engagement, wow, this was a, a huge part in the success of Smart Scale. We spent countless hours talking, meeting with people, holding webinars, over 27 public hearings. In fact, we literally drove over 20,000 miles during this process. We listened. We wanted to receive and hear feedback. We wanted it to be a collaborative, open-ended conversation so that we could all work through this process and make sure that at the end we have something that worked well for everybody. That piece was critical to getting smart skill through. We also had to respond to our legislators. Anytime they had a question, we needed to be there and answer. In fact, when General Assembly opened up, um, the following session, we went to them on day one with a binder full of all of our scorecards, explaining them and showing them what the process was. Our guiding principles for measures. Um, transportation officials and, and those who are in the transportation field speak and use words that others don't know. Um, acronyms, you know, things mean different things depending on who you're talking to and we found that we needed to make sure that this process was something that could be easily understood not only for transportation officials but for our average citizens who truly just want to have a better way or a quality of a life. The characteristics that we really looked for and I say you know five W's the who, what, when, where, how, um, what, what was going to be our unit of measurement, when the time period or analysis and the analysis of change from the existing conditions, where, what facility, corridor, or region, how, you know, what model are we going to use? Are we using manual calculation, GIS tools, existing data that we have, as well as info from project sponsors, and how can the project impact the outcome of a measure? The process that we use to develop these, these measures, as Eric mentioned, we spent several months researching other states, DOTs, and POs to figure out what was being done presently. The secretary established an executive work group that was headed up by our agency heads as well as other division administrators to oversee the implementation of the process. In all honesty, this required extraordinary coordination, creativity, problem solving and a commitment to the success of the overall program. There were a number of activities that were concurrently going on while others were working. Um, we had three sub work groups that were concurrently working, one on um, funding and programming, one on measuring outcomes, and we actually had another group that was working on the IT or the platform that was going to help run this all. In addition to all of the outreach that was going on in webinars. So, um, again, you know, the, the peer workshop and exchanges that we had, we also did a survey at our yearly Governor's Transportation Conference that went out to over 1,200 people to get feedback on. We definitely wanted to take in as much information as we could, and that process itself has shown to have been successful. So in 2015, our General Assembly recommended changes to our existing formulas. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into to detail about this, but what it did was created two sources of funding and from those two sources of funding it allowed our district grant program and our statewide high priority program to be put in place and both of those are used for our smart skill um, projects. So once the projects are scale, scored and put on the scale and ranked, we then go through the funding scenario and funding them from top to bottom depending on what grant program they're in. So the benefits of, of smart scale. Um, one of the things I think was very apparent is that we created transparency. Um, prior to all of this, you know, Many were not aware of what the funding was, you know, where the money was coming from, where it was going to, how projects were being funded, nor did they know how this was being done. Um, our CTB meetings are now streamlined and at every, it seems like just about every meeting over the course of the past year, there's been some discussions around House Bill 2. 
We also stood up a website that includes everything and anything you can think of related to smart scale. And we've put that information out there along with the scores, any discussions or videos that were recorded are also there. Um, it definitely has enhanced accountability. And also um, the tangible, tangible result at the end is for the Commonwealth to be able to fiscally use monies efficiently and the expected return on the investment will also be realized. So with that I'm going to turn this over to Chad and he's going to talk about integrating the planning and programming processes. All right, and I, I am going to go fairly quickly. There's a lot of material. I wanted to try and give as much information about exactly what we did, the different phases of the process. So the first part is, you know, leading up to a project being submitted. So VTRANS is the overarching multimodal statewide plan. It's more of a policy level document, but it does establish where the needs are throughout the state. And then you've got the local and regional plans that are sort of coming up with the project suite, if you will, to address the needs. Um, smart scale is how we score and evaluate um, the projects against one another and then as when it went over there's there's a dedicated funding pots you know money for each district as well as a statewide pot um, that is used to fund projects through smart scale so VTRANS uh, as I mentioned is the, the the vision document the policy document but it also includes the needs assessment um, and that needs assessment is is broken up into several pieces that I'll go over here in a, in a minute um, House Bill 1887, as I mentioned, is established the funding pots uh, in the first round, um, and this is actually a little bit dated, it ended up being a little bit more money than this, but there's money statewide in the high priority um, that projects compete for, and then there's separate set-asides for each construction district, um, and I think that addressed some of the political concerns that folks had about wanting projects to compete regionally uh, and this sort of splits the difference. You know, you're focusing your high priority on your statewide important needs, but but also have uh, money set aside to fund projects in particular districts. Um, so VTrans is, as I mentioned, is sort of that filter. So how do you how do you not burden the analytical process because it is quite burdensome of having to evaluate projects that really aren't addressing any identifiable need. Um, and, and that's where VTRANS comes into play and in specifically um, the, the needs assessment. So there's four categories of needs. Um, there are needs on quarters of statewide significance, which would be the blue lines you see on the map. Uh, we also have regional networks, which are those sort of reddish burgundy uh, areas, and those do include facilities that extend and connect those areas through the rural areas. Um, and then uh, we've got urban development areas, and those are areas that are designated locally to support mixed-use development, um, uh, higher density development. Um, they have to be formally um, formally adopted by the local by the local governments. And then there's uh, the safety need category. So a project has to address a need in one of those categories in order to be screened in for the scoring and analysis. Um, if, if not, it gets screened out, um, and, and there were several projects, I'd say right around 10% of the projects actually got screened out that were submitted because they weren't addressing a need. Um, so again, I've, we've got more detail. I'm not going to go in on what exactly the quarters of statewide significance, uh, regional networks, and, and UDAs are, and also some content on you know, how we define uh, safety needs throughout the state. Um, there's a there's a link here at the bottom. You can go in, to an interactive map and actually zoom in and click. Um, and the needs are sort of broken up by intersection and then by roadway segment. So how do people submit? You know, what are the rules for submitting an application, and what is the tool by which people would submit an application for Smart Scale? Um, so the first thing I'll go over is sort of the eligibility. Um, regional entities, which would be MPOs and PDCs, they can submit for quarters of statewide significance and also the regional network, but they cannot submit for a UDA. That has to be submitted uh, locally. Uh, local governments can submit for all three categories, but if they're submitting for a quarter of statewide significance, they have to get a resolution of support from the relevant regional entity. So if it's in an MPO area, they got to get a resolution of support from the MPO. 
if it's outside the MPO area, they need to get a resolution of support from the Planning District Commission, which would be Virginia's equivalent of a rural planning organization. Uh, and then public agents, public transit agencies um, can submit for both quarters of statewide significance and regional networks, but they again have to get a resolution of support from the, the, the governing regional, um, regional body. Um, how do they go about submitting? We wanted, uh, we knew from the beginning we, we want to leverage technology to make it easy for folks to be able to submit their projects. Uh, we didn't want them to have to hire a consultant, so on and so forth. So the decision was made to build a web application that folks could use to uh, develop their, their application submittals. That actually helps us on our end because now we have a, a consistent format that we're receiving the applications in and can integrate into our um, data and analysis systems here in, in Virginia. Um, so there are eligible entities, local governments, they get set up with an account. Um, there's security where they log in. Uh, to the system, they can create their applications, manage their applications. They don't have to finish it before they close. They can hit save, come back to it later uh, during the two-month window that we're accepting applications. Um, there's actually some enhanced functionality we're building in this next round, which will have some comment and, and alerts that will facilitate um, some of the feedback between the state and the applicant if there's questions about their application. Um, they can georeference where the project's at, um, you know, in the state. Um, now, once the application is submitted, there's sort of a two-step or a concurrent effort whereby we validate and we go through the screening process. Um, validation is really either VDOT or DRPT, which is our um, rail and public transit agency, are going in and looking at, is the project ready? Is it eligible? So there's some project eligibility things like studies are not allowed. Um, if somebody's proposing a brand new interchange on the interstate and there's been no study or no IJR, you know, you haven't done your homework, you haven't met the, the minimal planning requirements. Um, if it's an EIS level improvement and there's no identified preferred alternative, you know, that would be grounds to, to to not validate or screen out a project. Um, so th these are some of the things that are looked at as to really that project eligibility and project readiness um, and, and whether or not the project gets evaluated. And then second is that VTRAN screening I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that's where we're looking at whether or not the project is addressing one of the identified needs and the VTRAN's needs assessment. You know, is it meeting a, a need on a quarter of statewide significance? Uh, a regional network, UDA, or safety. Um, so now, assuming it's 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 now screened in, um, now we actually have to go about measuring and calculating a score for each of the projects. Um, so as Ronique mentioned earlier, there are six factor areas we look at, safety, congestion, accessibility, environmental quality, economic development, and land use. Um, and those were actually in the code in the Code of Virginia that established and directed the, 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 the CTB to create a process. Um, but we had to figure out, well, how do you measure safety? How do you measure congestion and so on and so forth? So some of the goal, we, we established some goals up front of really, we want measures that are looking at how are we reducing the number and rate of fatalities and severe injuries. For congestion, how are we reducing person hours of delay and increasing person throughput? Um, once you had sort of had these goals established and you've got a laundry list of possible measures, it, it kind of helped us narrow down, um, you know, which measures do we pick? You know, the other thing we had to realize or had to take into account is we were going to have about a three-month window to evaluate hundreds of projects. So you've got to kind of scale your methodology and your approach to your resources and the amount of time you're going to have to evaluate these. So, for example, like congestion, you know, there's not going to be enough time or resources to do like a, a robust VISM analysis for every single project. Um, so, so picking measures that are doable, that you have the data for, is really important. So for safety, um, and you're going to see the, the, the weighting within the factor area. So here we've got two measures, each one weighted at 50%. 
The first one, what is the expected or calculated reduction in fatalities and severe injuries? And what is the reduction in the rate of fatalities and severe injuries? Um, so those are the two measures. And the way we do that for, for highway projects is we break the project up into its components, its intersections and segments, um, and then we, we, we get the crashes for those segments, um, which are over the last five-year period, and then we apply the, a crash modification factor based on what the project's doing. So if this intersection is going from four-way stop to a you know a roundabout, that's going to have a specific crash modification factor, and that allows us to calculate both the reduction in frequency as well as rate. Um, for transit and TDM projects, we identify the corridor served, and then we look at how much volume are we pulling, how much off of the roadway and onto the transit mode, um, and we can look at that VMT reduction and use that to calculate the crash reduction. Uh, on the congestion side, the two measures are what is the peak period person throughput increase and what is the amount of peak period person hours of delay reduction. Um, for the throughput increase, if, if the facility is not at capacity now, then it's deemed you're not going to increase any additional throughput. So you have to be at or over capacity in order to get any increase in throughput. Um, so that's one way we look at it, but we also add on to that uh, that vehicular throughput increase as a result of the project. Um, we look at, you know, are we providing bicycle facilities, uh, sidewalks? What is the non-SOV person throughput increase? Maybe there's a, a bus service that's tied to the to the highway project. So those um, non-SOV throughput um, gets added gets added in. Um, so the vehicle throughput gets converted to a, a person throughput based on an average occupancy rate um, in the state. The, the person hours of delay um, is really based on that volume delay function that many of us are familiar with, with travel demand models and so on and so forth. So we're able to calculate the volume capacity ratio um, without the, you know, sort of no build versus build. Um, and, and we've sort of came up with a way to apply this, whether it's a highway project or whether it's a transit project. And I think this next slide sort of illustrates this. So we we know what our v, our v over C is and no build. And then your your improvement is either doing one of two things. You're you're decreasing the V. So you're you're investing in transit. You're investing in parking rides. You're doing things that are reducing the demand on the facility or and or you're improving the sea. You're enhancing the capacity, the carrying capacity um, of the facility. You could be doing both. And that that delta then allows us to calculate what, what do we anticipate the delay reduction is going to be as a result of this um, result of this proposed improvement. Uh, we also uh, leveraged FHWA's CapEx tool. Um, I don't know if you're from y'all are familiar with that, but it's a really cool tool for evaluating intersection level improvements. Uh, we were able to modify that and actually get delay calculations uh, for interchanges and for intersections as a result of you know putting in turn lanes and things like that. So accessibility, um, there are three measures in this. You can see the weightings here. The first two are really dependent upon the analysis we did in congestion. So as part of congestion, we're, we're calculating the speed change as a result of the as a result of the improvement. That speed change is then uploaded into a GIS tool and is used to analyze how many more jobs are now accessible, you know, total jobs, and how many jobs are accessible now for disadvantaged population groups. And then the third one is looking at that. Um, are we enhancing the connection between modes and promoting mode choice? Um, so how we do uh, the access to jobs is, um, and I think this graphic sort of best explains it. So we have that before and after speed. Before the improvement, you know, this quarter is operating at 20 miles an hour, and then after it's going to be operating at 40. Um, at the block level, you're able to say from this block is able to access these other blocks with the no build speed. And you do that for essentially for each block. You go to block two and say, all right, now this, this block can 
get to all these other blocks. And you sort of do that for every every census block that you've got data for. And then you go to your build scenario and say, all right, now the speed along this link is improved to 40 miles an hour. I can get to all the previous blocks, but there's some extra blocks that I now can get to that have jobs. Um, and you do that for each and every uh, each and every block, and you, you calculate this composite job access increase. Um, and so that's how both the the access to all jobs and the access to jobs for disadvantaged population groups work. Um, if you're adding a new transit connection, you know that also um, plays into the analysis. So then the third one under accessibility is how are we enhancing access to travel options? You know, does this project pr improve transit? Does it provide parking ride, bike, ped? And then that's scaled by the number of non-SOV users that we estimate are going to benefit from that. Um, so the number of transit users, the number of bike users then get multiplied by those points. So the more users and the more points, the higher score you get for this particular measure. Uh, environmental quality. So the the first one is sort of that uh, air and energy. You know, how is the project going to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and promote energy efficiency? And then, how is the project? What is the potential for the project to have an impact to the natural and uh, environment or cultural resources? Um, so the air quality and energy are. You'll see some redundancy in some of the the previous measure, but are we? providing bike pet facilities, making improvements to transit, or addressing a freight bottleneck. And then those points are scaled by the number of non-SV users and the truck volume. Um, for the environmental impact, or the potential for environmental impact, we've got various layers of conservation lands, threatened and endangered species, uh, cultural resources, and we, we do a buffer analysis around the project. So we look a quarter mile around the project um, what is the, the total acreage in each of these categories that potentially could be impacted? Um, we then look at what the project's actually doing, and that sort of factors in how we weight that acreage. So if it's a project that requires an EIS, we take 50% of that acreage. If it's an EA, we take 30%, and if it's a categorical exclusion, we take 10%. Um, and the, the points or the end measure is actually those acres divided by the total buffer area around the project um, with the lowest impact or no impact getting the full 100, 100 points. And so this kind of gives you, gives you an indication of sort of how the math works to come up with the scaled acres that get the, then get divided by the, the total buffer for that quarter mile. Um, economic development, this is one we definitely um, struggled with some uh, it, it's a tough it's a tough measure um, so how are we supporting uh, you know site development um, you know how is the project supporting intermodal access and then you know is the project improving travel time reliability so those are sort of the three measures and uh, so the first one a lot of the data for this one from the the site development supported, comes from the actual applicant and is included in the application. So they list off all the individual parcels and sites that they say are going to support and the further along that site is in the development process, the more points it gets. Um, so if it's in the comp plan, there's already a submitted site plan and the site utilities are in place, you know, it would get more points than something that's just, just zoned. Um, and so this, this one just gives you an idea of how we go about weighting the square footage. So the further along it gets, the more points. But also the, it, there's a decay factor, if you will, for how far away the site is from the project. Um, so you get divided by the distance. And then what type of access is this project providing? Is it providing direct access to the, to the site, or is it more of an indirect access? Um, and this is one where we're, we're in round two, we're going to be implementing some modifications. Um, we were getting some very creative, I guess is the best <laughs> way to put it, applications where, you know, uh, this is a roadway lighting project, but it's going to benefit this industrial site six miles away. Um, 
So we, we definitely realized after round one we need to tighten up the rules related to what sites you can take credit for uh, under this particular measure. Um, for intermodal access, you get points based on whether or not the project is improving access to a distribution center or intermodal manufacturing facility. Uh, is it an improvement uh, to or improve access to on or improve access to an STA truck route? And then is it is it improving access or reducing congestion around ports or airports? Those points are then scaled by the freight tonnage along the corridor and we use the trans search data set to calculate the daily tonnage along the project. So here you've got points times tonnage to sort of scale your, your benefit or potential benefit for, for the quarter that's being served. Um, and then the, the final factor area is land use and this is another one of those points times um, uh, you know a data item. So you get points if the project's promoting walkable, bike-friendly, mixed-use development, if it's supporting infill development, and is there an access management or quarter management plan in place that exceeds sort of the minimal design standards. Um, you can get those points, and those points are then scaled by the, the 2025 population and employment density, I believe within a half mile of the, uh, the proposed project. Um, so as, as was mentioned earlier, that's only applicable to area types A and B. Um, so let's see here. So how scoring works. So we've done all this analysis. We've got all these measures. How do we come up with a score? And so one thing to realize, important concept to realize is, is this normalized score that we come up with. So you know, every measure is compared against every other measure. And the highest measure gets a score of 100, or a normalized score of 100 for that measure, and everything else is sort of prorated off of that. Um, and it's those values that we then apply the weightings to. So as Ronique mentioned at the onset of this, we needed to be sensitive to the different needs of different areas of the state. And a lot of our public involvement revolved around this area type weighting. Um, you know, area type A is your really dense urban areas. Um, your Northern Virginia, Fredericksburg, um, which has got a, just a rapidly developing area that's being influ influenced by the Northern Virginia region. Hampton Roads. They put a premium on we really need to be focused on the congestion mitigation. Economic development, we got plenty of economic development. That's low on our priority list. Um, area, you know, area type D, on the other hand, the more rural areas of the state, they put a premium on economic development and safety. That, that's really what drives uh, what's important to those areas of the state. So these weightings are then used to weight those normalized scores to get the final benefit score at the end. So to kind of walk you through, here's an example project. So the normalized score for throughput was a 62, which tells you it's 62 percent of the highest value for the state. Um, you then apply the measure weight and those measure weights are consistent no matter what area type you're in. Um, you apply that weight, you then get down to the, the, raw, the raw factor score and then those, those area type weights come into play. So this example is an area type A, so that 55 points is going to get weighted by 45 percent. You do that for each of the factor areas to get your total project score and then you divide by your cost. You can divide by the total cost of the project or by the requested amount of funding. Um, in the end, what our board decided to use was the, the, the benefit score divided by the, the requested amount of funding. And there's some slides here in a minute that I think will show why that was the right thing to do because it actually allowed us to leverage a lot more funding than was available. So what were some of the lessons learned? Um, we had 321 applications were submitted. Um, you know, 131 individual entities were submitting, submitted at least one. Uh, $6.9 billion in requests. Um, but it also included 6.2 billion of other leveraged funds. 
and there were 287 projects that made it through the validation and screening process and were actually scored and evaluated. Um, so here's a breakdown of the request for each construction district. Um, this is the amount of funding that was available in both the district grant program for each district and then what was available in the statewide high priority pot. But I'm a that bottom right corner there, so we had about $1.7 billion. And in the end, it, bottom bottom right, we we leveraged or allocated a total of $3.2 billion worth of project improvements, which shows you how much additional money was brought to the table by allowing folks to leverage local funding sources, regional funding sources, private funding sources. Um, so we were actually able to fund 163 of the 287 projects um, from, from for the first round. Um, we didn't want to rest on our laurels though. What were we very quickly after the first round we started going into let's let's circle up with applicants. Uh, let's talk to our external review group that we had involved. What are some things that we could do better? And how can we continue to improve the process moving forward? Um, some of the things that folks were seeing, you know, there was a there was a low cost bias, uh, if you will, and that was regardless of whether it was a rural area or an urban area. Really low cost projects, two, three hundred thousand dollars, even a million dollar project, didn't have to get a lot of points in any one area. They could have gotten a fraction of a point in this one area and sort of rose to the top. Um, some other, you know, things uh, that we heard were you know, we a lot of praise in the transparency of the, pro the process um, for the accessibility measure. You know, how can we look at other things other than work accessibility? So access to health care, access to, uh, you know, education, uh, things like that. Um, so we did a, a number of stakeholder surveys um, to figure out what we could do better. Um, you know, how can we improve the application process and the consistency? And I think so, a lot of the things you see here on this slide, I think we're just more of a function of it being the first time we went through it. Um, you know, uh, like the insufficient time. You know, the application cycle opened. They only had two months to put their applications in. But we've been reiterating, don't stop working on your project. Start now, eight months prior to round two. Start developing your projects now uh, that you want to submit. you got a lot more time for round two. Um, so there were some, uh, let me skip through here because I want to be, I want to give plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, we definitely wanted to improve the, knowing what projects are coming that allows us to better pre-collect data and information that we need for the analysis process. So we're implementing some things on that standpoint. Um, we are tweaking some of the measures. The environmental factor area was a problem. You know, project just happened to not be within a you know quarter mile of anything, but it wasn't providing any congestion or safety benefits. Um, there were a number of projects where that was a significant portion of their their total. I've already mentioned some of the challenges we have with the economic development site support and needing to have more rules around that. A um, couple of tweaks with the reliability, uh, intermodal access, nothing major, just uh, trying to address some weird anomalies we saw with some of the projects. Um, I think, you know, in safety, we focused on fatal and severe injury in round one. That's a, those are, they represent 7% of all crashes. So I think, we got support that, hey, we really should be looking at all injury crashes uh, and, and applying the, the equivalent property damage only weighting and then some minor tweaks to land use. But all in all, folks were very, very happy. Um, this slide here is just related to, you know, we had some transit station improvements. You have to have the platform extended in order to facilitate a longer train in the future. But because the project didn't include the longer train, it didn't get any of the congestion benefit. And so for round two, we've, we've come up with an approach that we feel like will address this chicken and egg problem where you can't get the station improvement to facilitate the future capacity uh, increase. Um, this will allow us to, to give it some of, the, some of the benefit based on the proportion of the project cost. Um, 
lot of a lot of people like the application, the online application. Um, we're making some enhancements to that tool. These are some of my thoughts of what I'm seeing. Really, the the spin-off benefits of Smart Scale. I've seen more emphasis on more thorough project planning, develop getting the project ready to go in, and I think that's a function of in the past. The process was let me get a nickel on my two dollar problem in the six year program and we'll figure it out. And that was not really wasn't an effective way of doing business. So, you know, making sure we've got uh, a, an effective project that we're sizing the, the solution to the need. Um, that's a huge thing that I'm seeing statewide of folks really reevaluating project that didn't do well in round one. And looking at ways to value engineer it to really target the problem, as opposed to, um, you know, what what the ultimate dream might be. Um, and I think you know, smart scale because that denominator is the cost is really driving that. Um, whereas 10 years ago it was come to the state and ask for as much money as you could uh, for the project. And then really thinking beyond single occupant vehicles, you know, what where where are opportunities for bike ped for transit for TDM and marrying those in and submitting those projects uh, because they did very, very well in round one. Here's the, the sort of the cycle, um, the, the, buy, the, the cycle that will go into effect every two years. This first two rounds we're doing back to back, but the thought is here moving forward it would be every two years. Um, here's some resources. Um, the VASmartScale.org has a lot of information on what we did and how we did it, uh, as well as the V Unmuted. which has information on the, the the needs assessment and all that drives the screening process up front. And then with that, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Um, boy, that was a lot of information. I, I think it was fascinating. No, it was really good. It's fascinating. And I want to remind people that we will have these slides up on the SSTI website. So if you saw something go by, that you wanted more information on, um, you'll be able to get that um, as soon as we get the slides up, which will probably be um, later today. So, but certainly tomorrow, and the recording will be up tomorrow as well. So, um, we do have a few questions that have come in, and I am going to turn over asking the questions to um, Mary Ebeling, my colleague who is seated next to me and has been scrolling through the questions. Can't hear you. Can you hear Mary? No. No. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, looks like I'm looks like I'm on for the questions. <laughs> uh, I think her headset's not working. Um, so, the first one is: uh, Can you see some of these new measures like accessibility being used outside of the smart scale process? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's an it's a fascinating measure to me in that I mean, really, transportation is is it's getting you from where you are to where you want to be, and you know, um, I'm I'm excited about some of the work we're starting. It's not going to be ready for round two, but for round three expanding that accessibility to look at more than just access to jobs. Um, because as I see it, there's sort of two benefits. There's benefits to the person who can now get to more jobs um, and have more opportunities um, to better their quality of life, but there's also benefits to the employers in that they have a larger pool, if you will, of, of you know, people to hire from. Because uh, I know that's a really in, in access to educated and skilled labor is really important for economic development. So I, I think that measure, um, you know, we could be using that for a, a lot of different areas within within our you know planning processes. You know, how are we facilitating access to you know education and healthcare and and so on and so forth. Um, so there, that's a, a ripe area, if you will, for planning applications of, of how we use that. 
information. Great. This is could I, this is Eric. I'll just jump in because we're part of a task order that is working on that, and um, the state is going to make an accessibility tool available to stakeholders around the state outside VDOT and others. Uh, I can't remember how many seats they purchased, but with that very intent of letting uh, MPOs and local units of government um, use accessibility for um, their comprehensive planning or some of the other activities in the UDAs. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it, to me, I echo the excitement that um, Chad's expressing on that. I think it's going to be really cool. Okay, um, we did have a couple questions about the types of projects that were um, funded. Uh, does the process also accommodate infrastructure preservation projects such as light pavement treatments or is the process focused only on the creation of new facilities? Uh, it is not state of good repair type projects, so pay, repaving, uh, bridge rehabilitation, those were explicitly exempt from this project and were not eligible. There was a separate state of good repair program that was set up to focus on funding, um, bridge, particularly bridge improvements, you know, separate set asides for repaving operations and maintaining a good level of pavement. This strictly was geared towards, and I, I wouldn't say necessarily adding more pavement out there because we had, you know, it was parking ride improvements, bus, uh, new bus service, um, transit station improvements, um, safety, you know, safety, targeted safety improvements along corridors. Um, it was a pretty wide range of different project types that were submitted, but really were geared towards improving uh, capacity, either you're making the existing capacity more efficient uh, or, or safety was sort of the goal. And just to tag on to that, the code itself specifically calls out that it has to be capacity expansion projects. Okay. Uh, and sort of following up on that, uh, someone had a question about the breakdown of successful projects by mode type. Yes, we actually did do some recent um, statistics related to if it was a highway only improvement, uh, if it was a transit improvement or a TDM. Uh, and TDM and transit actually had a much higher success rate as a percentage of the projects submitted. Um, you know, I want to say the TDM was 100% of the requests were funded, and then for transit it was somewhere around 80% of the projects that were put in for funding got awarded, uh, whereas highway was somewhere around 55. Um, so, yeah, we have been developing sort of a breakdowns by mode and by project type, um, which gets a little bit challenging because in the application you you select the principal improvement type. Is this rail transit, bus transit, highway, or TDM? Um, but there were a number of projects that got highway was the principal improvement type, but it included like a park and ride and you know bike ped component and all. So you, you were, the project was doing multiple things all in one. So it's been teasing out those individual details, um, but we do have some pretty compelling statistics on you know what the successful success rate was for different projects. Okay, um, and I think uh, since we have a lot of people from uh, state DOTs, uh, we have a question about if another agency wanted to take this route, where should they start? And following up, what are the biggest technical? What were the biggest hurdles, technical or political? I think you definitely having the political support here, I think, was really key. You had a bipartisan will and desire right. to change the way things were being done, which right. were untransparent, which changed from administration to administration, which, to be honest, is very frustrating to the to the tra transportation agencies too. You know, you get. 40% through a project and then it gets put on the shelf because there's other priorities as, as Ronique mentioned. So I think that building that political support um, is important up front. And then I guess the advice I would give is don't don't overcomplicate it at least at the beginning. The, the measures need to be very simple, things that you can readily calculate. Um, you know, we had 
three months essentially to analyze 287 projects for all the measures I, measures I just went over. And so you, you gotta ha you have to scale your approach to that reality. Now, if you have fewer projects and much a lot more time, then you can have more robust analysis being done. But I tend to think that part of the reason round one was as successful as it was is we were very targeted in what we wanted to measure, and we we favored simplicity and ease of understanding what we were measuring over robustness of technical analysis. If you can't explain it to a board member or a legislator or to the general public, they don't understand how it works. It's much harder for them to support and buy into the process. Yeah, and I would say as a follow-on, the question as far as where do we start, I would say start with Virginia. <laughs> um, take the information that we have and the information that's out there and available on the website and certainly resources you can reach out to us you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel because the wheel's been created and is now, you know, being per not perfected, but um, we are making revisions to the process as we see fit moving forward for some of the anomalies that have come up and things that we need to change. But but use Virginia as as a framework and then shape it around to what works for your state. Okay. And maybe uh, we can just clarify um, in Virginia, the uh, Commonwealth Transportation Board is the decision-making body on what gets funded. Is that correct? Uh, the legislature doesn't get to kind of make the monkey around with your decisions. Is that correct? That's correct. They've tried. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we have a um, Transportation Accountability Commission that is bipartisan. Um, and, and they do get updates as far as where smart scale is and, and the projects. And of course, each of our representatives, you know, want something for their area and they want to make sure it fits for the area that they represent. However, our Commonwealth Transportation Board is the policy body um, that allocates funds for Department of Rail and Transportation and for VDOT and they have the, the full authority to determine what projects actually get constructed. So even though this is a prioritization process and they're ranked based on the, the top relative score, um, across statewide priority and then within the districts, each of our Commonwealth Transportation Board members do represent a certain area of the state and they do have the ability to pull a project out of the rank and say we want to fund this one. However, that does come with the responsibility and accountability to say why they're doing that. Okay. Well, so that might vary by state where the Transportation Board doesn't have the final authority. So the question of how does another state make this work might vary a lot depending on how the decisions are made. Absolutely. And also it may not require legislation. Yes. So again, that political will, just depending on the, the current state um, and, and how they get their, con their construction projects funded, you know, may be a little bit different. So it may be something administratively that the state can do versus going the route of General Assembly. I mean, anytime you have to go to the legislature to get something passed, it, it, can, be, it can be difficult and you definitely have to be willing to go out there and, and have the conversations. And some of them can be and have been quite difficult. Okay. And um, I'll take just a couple more questions. I want to be mindful of people's time, but if people need to leave, I do want to remind people that the webinar will be up on the website tomorrow. And uh, if you would like to find out about future uh, webinars from SSTI, we invite you to subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on Twitter, and check out our website. Uh, we have lots of good information, including uh, more information on some of the uh, work that's been done in Virginia. Um, I think you did mention something about uh, the rail uh, being included, and someone did ask if intermodal freight-specific or freight rail projects were eligible, or is this mostly aimed at moving people? Now, freight, freight rail is eligible. Um, we did not, in round one, have a freight rail project submitted, but we did we had mocked out how we would analyze that. So essentially if we, if it were a freight rail project to improve capacity for freight rail, 
we would we would work with um, DRPT to estimate the number of trucks. You know, what quarter is that rail line serving or corridors, and then how many trucks would be potentially that pull off of the roadway, um, and then that would be used to calculate the speed increase and the accessibility and congestion, safety, so on and so forth. Um, so round two, we might we might actually get one um, get one to analyze hopefully. Okay. Okay, and I'll I'll make this the final question. Um, it sort of wraps up a little bit. Uh, given that round one scores were done so quickly, uh, what are the major changes for the next round, uh, if any? Um, we've got some some tweaks to uh, the measures themselves and how they're calculated. We're putting a lot of emphasis on getting awareness of what projects are coming so that we can pre uh, collect. There was a graphic earlier in the slide that you might see that's like a chart. I was uh, over a hundred applications were, were actually entered for the first time into the system the last two weeks of the before the deadline. And we're trying to encourage folks to give us awareness earlier on in the process so that we can start collecting data. Because it to be quite honest, it was a photo finish up into January. Um, there are some things we're doing to try to uh, reduce the amount of manual key entry. A lot of our method was relying on Excel spreadsheet work, worksheet templates that we had created, uh, and we're integrating that with our um, Oracle database to, that will allow us to reduce the amount of time it takes to get the data entered into the system to run the analysis. So just, just tweaks like that of how we can streamline, leverage technology to do the analysis um, better and quicker. Um, but as far as the actual measures themselves, mainly for round two, it's mainly just minor tweaks to address some of the anom anomalies we saw in round one. Okay. Well, I want to thank Chad and Ronique for joining us today. Uh, I think it was extremely informative. And I want to thank everybody else for joining us. And uh, if you have further questions, uh, I believe you can find Chad and Ronique's contact information on the Virginia DOT website. And thank you both for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank Ellie. you. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.